Well, thanks very much. Thanks, Paul. Pleasure to be here. Um, I just want to ask real quick before we get started, you're talking about the ORPP, and I wasn't quite clear on what you said. Would you drop it if the federal government expands the CPP? So if, the, uh, if any enhancement that was designed um, dealt with the two-thirds of the population that doesn't have, uh, doesn't have a workplace pension plan, because that is, that's, what we, that's the problem that we right. are trying to solve, and if that enhancement were adequate to the, uh, the level that we've identified as being necessary, absolutely. So that's the conversation okay. we'll be having with you. Okay. But, you know, it'll be a conversation, Paul, around the table with all of the premiers. Okay. And we're not all in the same place. Right. Um, okay, well, let's, let's start on the bigger picture then. Um, last week, Bank of Canada lowered its outlook for the Canadian economy, said the oil overhang is going to last at least a couple of years. The job market is pretty stagnant right now. Um, there's a pretty harsh questionnaire on the tables here, and I, and I saw the results of last year's questionnaire, which weren't very good. Lots of concern out there. You've got a pretty big deficit now. How are you going to possibly fulfill some of these priorities you were just talking about? Well, we're, you know, we're on track to, if, you, if you're talking about the, the deficit, I mean, we're on track to eliminate the deficit by 2017-18. Um, my responsibility is to recognize the challenges, um, but, you know, I don't, I don't have the luxury of being able to sit and wring my hands about it. You know, we have to, we have to dig in, we have to take the actions that uh, we've looked at other jurisdictions and, and say, okay, well, what are the things that we can do here in Ontario that, uh, that build on our strengths? So when I talk about our talent and skills, when I go to the, um, the, the plants, uh, the business mm -hmm. places of uh, the people who are making things or um, uh, starting businesses or expanding businesses in Ontario, I hear over and over and over again that our, that our workforce is a huge advantage. And people coming here, they can, they can count on having smart, educated people. And that, so if that's one of our strengths, then we need to build but, but on that. Where, where's the money going to come from, though? That, that's, I guess, the question a lot of people have. If we have a big deficit, you're trying, to, you're trying to ratchet down, and we have a sluggish economy that's not going to generate a heck of a lot of tax so, revenue. Where's the money coming yeah, from? Yeah, so we've put, we've put out uh, an economic plan. We've put out a, a fiscal plan that has a bunch of components to it. So we did increase taxes. You know, we increased taxes in, in our last budget. We, we are leveraging assets, as everyone will know. There's a big discussion about Hydro One right. going on we'll right now. We'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah, we'll come back to Hydro One. I, I'm sure the Twitter sphere <laughs> asked you a question about that. Um, we, uh, we are making decisions to, uh, to sell off um, some of the, you know, we sold the GM shares, we sold some real estate. We're investing in, uh, we're investing in infrastructure that is going to foster growth. So we, you know, we have uh, made a decision to uh, not balance our budget early by making deep cuts, but by uh, leaving that 2017-18 date in place and making the investments that that will foster growth. Because when I talk to companies, I mean, I, I had these conversations in China um, the last time I was there, and they said, you know, we'd like to come to Ontario. We're not sure about your ability to build infrastructure. Now, we can't build infrastructure as quickly as the Chinese. Mm -hmm. That's just a reality. But they look at us and they want to know that we are committed to doing the things that will allow them to move their goods. If we can do that, then we will, we will continue to be the number one jurisdiction for but foreign direct investment. It's, it's interesting because one jurisdiction that, of course, you, you guys would be very familiar with that, that is really hurting us is Mexico. Uh, we've lost a lot of plants to Mexico, and it's not because of the low wages they pay or anything like that in Mexico. It's because their regulatory framework appears to be a lot more uh, sympathetic, understanding, whatever. You can get things built. You can get things done in Mexico Quick. a lot faster. Yep. We were talking to the head of you know, TransCanada Pipelines, and he was telling us how quickly it was to, to get a pipeline approved down there. You've seen the auto plants pulling up, not investing in Ontario, but going down there. How do we deal with that? What does the government do? Does the government go the Quebec route and spend more money on Bombardier, or does, do, you, do you change the regulations? What does the government do? Well, first of all, we have had, we have had investment in auto here. Um, but, but we're still right. losing plants. Right. We're right, yeah, we're competing with Mexico. So um, Ed talked about the regulatory uh, approach that we are that we're taking we're looking at other jurisdictions and we've had a we've had a process in Ontario where we've counted regulations and we've said you know every time you introduce a new regulation you have to take a number off the books what that resulted in was a kind of superficial exercise because it meant we were taking off taking regulations off the books that actually weren't necessarily the things that were holding up business so so we've got to do uh, this is like um, open for business phase two. We've got to we've got to be real about what it is that's actually 
uh, impeding business. So that's one piece. I think the other piece, and we've heard about this a lot, is when someone wants to um, expand a business or bring a business or do something in, uh, in Ontario, it's hard for people to find their way around government. And I, I have mm -hmm. heard that a number of times. And so the notion of a, a concierge service, the notion of one door that, and I said this last night to folks, where you don't open a door and then they just point to a whole bunch of other doors, but they actually navigate you. Whoever is at that first door actually helps you to navigate and actually helps you to get things done quickly. I think that's something that, that's that other jurisdictions doing, right? They do. brought exactly. the federal and state exactly. governments together to do just that. Yeah, so I think we've got to be much, much better about that and not be complacent in the sense that, well, you know, of course you want to come to Ontario and you'll just do whatever you have to do to be here. We have to assume that we have to roll out a carpet and, uh, and help people to find their way. So that's the second part of that competitive edge that we okay. need. Um, we talked about the new government, and one of the, the issues they're going to have to face immediately is the, the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, the, the TPP trade agreement. Right. Uh, we haven't heard yet what this government thinks about it. What do you right. think about it? Well, I'm, I'm excited about new markets. You know, I think that uh, having, having access to markets for, for the very reasons that we were just talking about in terms of uh, the need to export, I think that's very important. At the same time, we have some challenges. There's no doubt in the auto sector, you just, mm -hmm. you've just identified, you know, the, the auto sector is going through a transition in this province and, and in North America, quite frankly, not just, uh, not just Ontario. So we're, we're anxious about exactly what that will mean to our auto parts sector um, and the issues around supply management. You know, I, I've been the Minister of Agriculture and Food and being the Minister of Agriculture and Food means you are managing risk all the time. That's just what it is. Mm -hmm. So um, the fact is that the supply management system actually manages risk and allows for predictability. It now, gets us in a lot of trouble internationally. It, it gets us into trouble internationally. <laughs> I understand that. And it has to evolve. It has to change. So what I want to do is I want to, I want to make sure that we have a federal government that is going to work with us on that because we do we do have people in the uh, agri-food sector who understand that and who want to make rational decisions but I don't want to I want to, I don't, don't want to kneecap our dairy and uh, and poultry producers in the process so the outgoing government proposed uh, now this was during the election not, nonetheless but pretty substantial compensation for uh, dairy and for auto, uh, yeah. some of the auto parts yeah. makers. Uh, is that the kind of thing you think the federal government should be looking at or what you would be looking well, at? Well, I think, I think that the compensation, yes, I think the compensation is important. But you know, that's not actually a long-term solution, mm -hmm. right? Um, if your sectors are going to be competitive, then there have, to be, there have to be other things that happen to make them competitive. So yes, we'll be talking about what the compensation is, but what I want to talk with our auto sector and our, and we are, in our agri-food sector, is how do, we, how, do we, um, how do we upscale? How do we make sure that we are as good as and as competitive as, uh, as those, uh, those sectors? You know, China wants our food. Mm -hmm. They're interested in our food. Food security is a huge issue. Well, we, we get food security. We know how to do that. So let's leverage that knowledge and that capacity uh, internationally. All right, let's talk. Uh, let's talk Hydro One since we raised it. Um, obviously, you weren't, you weren't going to, right? <laughs> well, you raised it. Um, it, it you know, it, I know it, I started it, it. He started it. <laughs> That's right. Uh, you know, interesting, controversial. We've been we've been through this before, and it didn't work. Yeah. Uh, you guys are going out. Report out today, suggesting that this will actually drive up the public debt because of the revenue you're going to lose. Um, what about that? Why do it, and, and how do you address some of the criticism that's being uh, raised about it? So here's, here's where we start. I said Ed started. He didn't actually start it. We started it because what, what I know is that we have to invest in infrastructure, Paul. We don't, we don't have an option about that. You know, as a, as a province, decade after decade, we kind of let infrastructure deteriorate. We weren't even investing, before 2003 when we came into office, we weren't even investing enough to maintain the infrastructure that we had, let alone build. And if you look at the numbers right now across the country, everything that municipal and provincial and federal governments are doing gets us to about 3%. And mm -hmm. what we know is that if we're not investing 5% of GDP in infrastructure, then we're not building new. We're just kind of treading water. So. I came in into the leadership actually with a mandate 
to promote infrastructure investment. I did that at the national level with uh, my colleague premiers. And so when I came into, uh, at the point where we were building our budgets and how are we mm -hmm. gonna do this, there were a number of things that, uh, that we were gonna do and leveraging assets was one of them. And so we asked Ed and his team to look at the assets that, uh, that the people of Ontario own and it was a tough conversation. When I said Ed was a catalyst for lively debates, trust me, that was a lively mm -hmm. debate. Because yeah, but it's, it's your call, right? Not his call, right? Exactly. Right. It was my call. Right. And, I, and that's why I'm saying it. I was convinced that this was the best thing to do because it would get us a couple of things. It would get us a, a substantial amount of money, so $4 billion is what we, mm -hmm. uh, what we uh, projected, to allow us to continue to uh, add to that, that fund because right. we had done other things to, uh, to uh, build infrastructure. And at the same time, we could retain enough ownership, the 40% ownership of Hydro One. Um, our belief is that it, uh, you know, that it can be a better company. I mean, we've uh, talked about that publicly. Um, we would retain some control over, uh, over the, uh, the big decisions. And you know, I know that the, the big attack is on electricity rates, but that's actually not, that's not where electricity rates are set. They're set right, by the OED. Right. So in terms of the long term, we thought that this was the right way to go. The other factor is that the, the benefit, the economic benefit of the investments that we're going to make, I'm convinced that they will outweigh that, uh, that long-term um, change in the, in the revenue. You know, I, I think that if we don't make these investments in infrastructure, we're going to be in a, a much worse position. So, so you know, we are, we are very, very convinced that making these investments will make us a more attractive jurisdiction, will allow us to compete uh, with the, uh, with the um, jurisdictions that we are already competing with, right. and will allow businesses here to expand. Okay, so it's going no matter what? You're not going to... It's going, yes. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, i got to talk about unions, because I, I couldn't be here without talking about unions <laughs> and what's been going on lately. I mean, I'm thankful I don't have children in school anymore, because every time I pick up the paper, turn on the radio, there seems to be a work to rule or something going on, and I, I, I don't get it. I don't understand why these issues seem to keep up, keep coming up all the time. Um, I think a lot of people are concerned about these payments, which I know you're, you're trying to clarify and, and you, yeah. you're going to explain to me why we pay unions to negotiate agreements and not get receipts for them. Um, walk me through all this. What's going on? So let me just first of all put this in context because uh, I was the Minister of Education in this province. Uh, we've had many, many years of labor peace. It was one of the things that we came into office in 2003 and we have worked very well with our labor partners. There is no doubt that for the last couple of years there have been challenges and those are born of our financial situation. There's no, there's no doubt about it. I mean, there's a, there's a, a difficult uh, conversation at a bargaining table when there's no new money for compensation and I was committed to having a collective bargaining process that would play itself out and that would be respectful so it is it just is difficult <laughs> that's that's the reality uh, in terms of the process that uh, has required us to help to pay for uh, negotiating well because it was it's a new process it's the first time we've had a formal provincial process um, there, there's going to be an accounting of those dollars and the money hasn't flowed so there will be an accounting of uh, how that money was used. But remember there used to be 72 boards that negotiated with uh, their bargaining units and not just one teachers union but with their support staff and, and all of their uh, unions. So 72 boards using public dollars negotiating in, uh, in their own boards. This is the first time we've had a formal uh, provincial process. The, in the, the last couple of rounds, there's been an informal process where there was no, there was no requirement for boards and, uh, and uh, the unions to come to the table, and so there was a, an establishment of a protocol around how those costs were, uh, were shared, and this is the first Okay, but there, was, there wasn't a requirement for you guys to pay their, their costs, right? No, there's okay. no, no, there's no requirement. So why you're do it then? Why, right. why did we do it? Because isn't that prolong the negotiation? If I'm a union and I know you're going to come, come at me for a million dollars for pizzas or whatever, aren't I just going to sit at the table longer? So it's a $22 billion, 20, 20 plus billion dollar enterprise, Paul. So um, there's, a co there's always a cost of negotiation. When I, when I talk about those 72 boards, I was involved at, uh, at, the, uh, at the school board level. You know, there is, there's a cost of negotiations. There's no doubt about that. It's a long, some would say, 
antiquated process, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it takes a long time and it's got its own rhythm and there are costs associated with it. So we're going to make sure that we have the accounting of uh, how that money was spent and this is, th there won't be a first time again. This was the first time that there was this provincial process. And remember, we've got deals with most of the teachers in the province. We haven't right. got deals with this one group of teachers and, uh, and support staff. So am I happy about that? Absolutely not. You know, my kids, my kids were in school at the time when there was labor unrest through their whole, pretty much their whole school career. Mine too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I've worked really hard as a member of a government uh, before as a minister and now as the premier to make sure that that relationship worked better. We've done pretty well. The last few weeks hasn't okay, been Okay, so good. those payments aren't going to happen again. That was a one-off. Well, yeah, because there won't be the first, uh, the first process again. But will there always be a cost to negotiations? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but it's who picks up the, the tab for that cost. Exactly. That's the issue. Yeah. So you're saying the government's not going to pick up the tab going forward? I'm, you know what? I'm saying that there will always be a cost to negotiations and there will be an accounting for that. So they might well, pick up the tab. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I think you need, to, you need to look at negotiations across sectors. And you need to ask the question, has there ever been a case where employers have shared costs with employees? Yeah, there has been. And so I'm not going to, I'm not going to draw a line in the sand. They're not taxpayers. They're not taxpayers. Well, if my company does it, who cares? But if you do it, I care. Well, okay, but if, if the negotiation process is the same, and the, the money that teachers are using, you know, it's a public sector entity. The whole thing is public sector. All of the money that goes into our education system <laughs> is public sector dollars. Right. Okay. All right. Let's talk uh, environment for a second. Yeah. Um, climate change. I know uh, Conference Board or uh, Chamber of Commerce has done a report on this issue. Uh, cap and trade. Why do cap and trade? There's a lot of questions surrounding it now. It's not quite as in fashion as it used to be. A lot of folks are just saying go with a straight up carbon tax. Cap and trade is not the way to go. Too many exemptions. Too complicated. Forget it. Why, why are you guys going to continue with the cap and trade or are you going to continue? With it? We are. We are continuing with cap and trade and a uh, couple of reasons. We're sitting beside Quebec. Quebec is part of uh, a large North American market with California. We will make that larger and make it, uh, make it more efficient. Um, so that, that made sense to me that, uh, that we would work with Quebec and, uh, and California. And quite frankly, we had agreed a number of years ago um, before I was the Premier that we would be part of the Western right. Climate Initiative. And, and I think that it, uh, it makes more sense. And we've, we've been able to work with Quebec and learn from Quebec. And, uh, you know, I'll be seeing uh, Governor Brown when I'm in California. And I think that it, it, will, uh, it, will, be a good, it will be a good process for uh, the people of Ontario. And the second reason is that uh, I think that cap and trade offers the opportunity to incent uh, innovation in a way that, uh, that other systems don't necessarily. And so from a business perspective, um, I think that it, uh, it allows for that um, flexibility that uh, I think is good, for, is good for our innovation economy. Okay, so it's better than a carbon tax or, you, I mean, it's just an, a different option or? It's a, diff it's a different option. Right. It's the one that we've chosen. I think that, uh, you know, w one of the things that I have uh, I really appreciated about my conversations across the country with my colleague premiers is that there is no one size that fits all. So, you know, Christy Clark will, Christy Clark will sit here and tell you why the carbon tax is uh, what she chose, what, uh, what they right. chose and that it's working. I just think you're, you know, you pick your circumstance, you, you, you understand your circumstances. We're in this, uh, in this geographic uh, connection with Quebec. I think it makes sense. And from my perspective, I see more opportunity for flexibility and innovation in it. Okay. And I, I got asked about one other topic that's, that's near and dear to me, and that's beer. Um, <laughs> you know, one question I get all the time. Near is, and dear to lots yeah. of people, apparently. <laughs> Why can't I just go to the corner store? I lived in Britain for two years before I came back to the, take this job. I, in a tiny village, I could go across the street to my spa store and buy a six-pack or a bottle of wine. Why can't I do that here? Why do we have this ridiculous system? I think, sorry. Yeah. Why do we have this system <laughs> that's, that's, that's coming that is so hard to understand and so weird? Why not just open it up? Well, okay, so we're not starting from a blank slate, right? We've got... We've got a, a system, we've got a distribution system in place in Ontario that has built up over years. I mean, talk about regulations that have built, been built up over years. Our, our alcohol distribution system is rooted in all sorts of things, including, including our Presbyterian background, right. you know. Um, so, so we're working with the system that exists. And one of, the, one of the challenges is that if we blow up that distribution system, we actually run the risk of increasing the cost of, uh, of your beer. 
Because if you look at other jurisdictions that, that have a, a less efficient distribution network, that's actually what happens. So we're trying to protect that distribution system because it protects the cost um, to consumers. And at the same time, broaden it so that it is more rational. If we were establishing the uh, alcohol distribution system today, would it look the same? Of course it wouldn't. But uh, the people of Ontario, I get, I get equal number of emails saying that you should make it more open to you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. You know, right. I mean, it's, it's but, but it not seems kind of weird. This is, we're having a discussion about legalizing marijuana. And, and God help us if we ever try and get that into stores, corner stores. I mean, we can't even figure out. So <laughs> I, the emails different. I get on that is that it should just go into the LCBO. <laughs> well, there, there you go. But I mean, really, it, do you think you're going to see a day? You're, you're a lot younger than me. So in your lifetime, no, I'm are not. you going to see? Are we going to see a day where I can walk across the street to my 7-Eleven or wherever and buy a six-pack? Do you think we'll see that day in Ontario? Well, say yes. Please. Not under my. <laughs> <laughs> Not on my watch, you won't. But you know, who knows? At some point, uh, at some point, you might. But but there are. There's not social license for that at this point. There just isn't. Okay. And um, you can. You know, we can have a we can have a debate about that. Here's here's one of the conversations we haven't had in this uh, in this country, quite frankly, but in this province for sure. Um, we have not had a discussion about how we're doing on the alcohol front. You know, how are mm -hmm, we doing mm -hmm. with the, you know, the kids with their backpacks, with, uh, with uh, the beer beach drinking and, and everything else. Uh, yeah, mm. yeah. And so that's the that's the other side of it. And I don't I don't mean to sound like my Presbyterian ancestors, although it would be inconsistent. My staff will know if I didn't. <laughs> Um, that's, a, that's a conversation that we have to have. I don't think it's related to the distribution particularly, but I think it's the, it's the reason that we get you know, just as many emails saying, don't open it up, there's too much alcohol, as we do saying, open it up, give it to me everywhere. Okay, uh, and let me ask you this finally, because I don't even know how much time we have left, but you've been a good sport for staying here this <laughs> long and answering these awful questions. But um, <laughs> going forward now, you've got, you know, you've got this uh, new federal government that right. um, obviously you guys are gonna have a better relationship than the last government. But are you still going to be able to, I mean, I know what your answer is, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, are you still going to be able to say no? Are you still going to be able to say, you know, hang on, you're wrong. We, we can't do that. We have to do this. I mean, you know what I mean? I mean yeah. Is it yeah. going to be too close a relationship? No, I, I think that it's interesting because the other question I get asked is, well, what happens when, uh, when Justin says no? So not just when exactly. we say no, yeah. when, when Justin Trudeau says no. Um, I firmly believe that that's, that's how relationships work, you know, that... Of course we're not going to agree on everything. There are going to be things that I do that he's not going to agree with and vice versa. But if there's, if there's enough of a, an ongoing constructive dialogue, then you can work through those things. If you don't have that, if you don't have a way of picking up the phone and saying, could we talk about this, then that's where you get into trouble and that's where it gets very positional and that's not, that's not mm -hmm. helpful to the people of the, well, it's not helpful to the people of the province, but it's not helpful to the people of the country. Because remember, this is about partnering not just with Ontario, this is about partnering with all of the premiers. And I can tell you, uh, my colleagues and I are very eager to have a, that first first minister's meeting and actually be able to have a dialogue. Okay, and, and finally, I want to ask you this. What, what's the one big thing that keeps you up at night? What's the one thing you're, you're looking out for either the rest of this year into 2016 that, we, that really worries you? <laughs> <laughs> Only one. Only one. <laughs> there are lots of things at three in the morning. Uh, you know, I think, that, I think that this conversation about what, what is our economy going to look like, and I, sometimes I, uh, I think of it in terms of what's the work going to be? I've got a two-year-old grandson and a, a four- and a six-year-old four six granddaughters. What is their work going to look like? You know, what is, what is it that they are going to be confronting in terms of their opportunities? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, we're actually not that different in age, and so I can remember in the, in the 70s talking about, you know, the nature of work and the, mm -hmm. the three-day work. And everybody had jobs for 30 years. And every, yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's completely changed, and, um, but even then, the, the futuristic discussion about what work was going to look like, well, that hasn't transpired. People aren't working three mm -hmm. days a week, and, and the, the um, nature of work is changing, and, and, uh, you know, we talk about manufacturing. Well, the reality of advanced manufacturing is there are fewer jobs. Yeah. And so we just, we have to have, we have to be very live to um, a discussion about what, what do we expect people to be doing and how do we prepare them for that. And so when we talk about entrepreneurialism and uh, creating opportunities for young people to have workplace opportunities, I go to, we've got to start in kindergarten. You know, we've mm -hmm. got to start when kids mm -hmm. are very, very little, um, helping them to, 
use their capacity for creativity and critical thinking and elicit that from them because that's going to be our edge in the, uh, in the global and, and it has changed so much. Even part-time work now is so much different than when you and I probably had part-time jobs Absolutely. in high school and that. People working right to the limit, you know, zero hours, they get called in, you know, and so many more part-time jobs. The, the labor market has changed so much. Well, and I go, you know, I go into a lot of Tim Hortons around this province. And um, it's, it's not kids who are working mm -hmm. the Tim Hortons mm -hmm. jobs, right? It's, it's women my age who are working in Tim Hortons. And they're there because they have to be. And, and that's, that's one problem. But the other problem is that uh, kids are having a different experience of, uh, of work early on. So, so if I had to say the thing that keeps me up at night, that really is it. Because that, that sort of encompasses everything. And when I talk about the economy being about our quality of life and being about our education and our healthcare system, if we don't figure out those big economic realities, we can't do the other things that, uh, that we are called upon to do. Okay. All right. I'm going to leave it there. Um, thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. <laughs> That's a good question. That was fun. Yeah.